Uh, I'm an economist, that's my background. I work at Nottingham University in the business school there. I have to thank David for the... I, I, I saw Gavin's snappy title about what is truth, and I said I wanted one too. And so, uh, so David Jones gave me the, the follow the science question mark because part of what I want to talk about is how I think we need a much broader understanding of some of these issues than just what we see in the science. So I just wanted to start, start by going back to what we've seen over the past few years. So you remember back in 2021, we had uh, care workers being sacked because they weren't, if they refused to get vaccinated, if they refused to have two vaccines in England. We had um, the Plan B, where vaccine passports were introduced, really targeted at young people. If you had to go into a uh, you know, nightclub or crowded event, you were meant to be, have proof of vaccination. We had things like Piers Morgan. This was a, a fairly sort of typical quote of many people at the time. Those who refuse to be vaccinated should be refused NHS care if they then catch COVID. Let them pay for their own stupidity and selfishness. We had uh, Jurgen Klopp saying, refusing vaccines is like drink driving. It endangers other others. Uh, in America, it's time to make life a living hell for the unvaccinated. It, it's like perhaps hard to remember, you know, time moves on very quickly, doesn't it? But the sort of environment we were living in. Uh, Macron in France, um, we must pee, uh, XXX them off with new measures to make the unvaccinated feel sort of unwelcome in society. Trudeau, unvaccinated were racist and misogynist extremists. Um, the Pope was in, the, in on the act as well. So he called opposition to COVID vaccine suicidal denial. And he said, ethically, everyone should receive coronavirus protection. So he's really saying everyone should be vaccinated. I think at one time he called it a sort of an, an act of love. Um, and he sort of followed through with this. So enforced it in the Vatican. So if you're in the Swiss Guards, you had to be vaccinated. And some Swiss Guards resigned or were sort of pushed out. And you know, who knows what's really going on behind. But they claimed they'd been sort of uh, seminars to indoctrinate them, saying to, you know, you, you must take this, this uh, vaccine. Canada, Canadian diocese, you had to be vaccinated to attend mass. We didn't see quite so much of that in the UK, but actually there was, uh, this was headlines from a Nottingham parish, I'm from Nottingham, uh, where the parish was asked the faithful not to attend mass unless they had the COVID vaccine. So this is quite serious stuff, isn't it? Um, and, and perhaps most serious of all in New York and various other places they were talking about vaccine mandates for children to go to school. So you wouldn't be allowed to go to school unless you were fully vaccinated against, uh, against COVID. The point of all that is they were unprecedented times. Uh, and it's important to remember, I think, what we, what we went through, because we're talking not just about vaccine personal decisions, but about policy and environment uh, in which people were sort of you know, held, held up to shame and embarrassment and so on. And thinking about that, I think we need to, to use a number of tools to assess all sorts of things. So personal vaccination decision, what, what's right? Um, pastoral public health advice. So those of you who are seminarians, you know, many priests were talking about vaccination from the, from the pulpit and following the line of the Pope, or going further, bishops saying you had to be vaccinated to attend mass. Uh, social media claims. How do we assess this issue about uh, you know, where, is, where is the truth? How, who do we listen? How do we regulate things? But also policies, and policies can be very different to personal decisions. So vaccine mandates for care workers, passports, all sorts of other vaccine-related decisions. And yet we need scientific literacy. So we need to understand about things like efficacy, side effects, mechanism of action, the development, links to abortion, and so on. That's all important. But we also need statistical literacy, so what Gavin was talking about. So understanding what, that, what the scientific evidence, what does that mean in practice? Is it statistically significant? What does it mean in the real world? So things like relative versus absolute risk, benefits and costs. But I think we also need social science literacy. I would say that because I'm an economist, so broadly in the social sciences. But thinking about economic costs, particularly when we come to policy decisions, um, behavioural effects, so how people might change their behaviour once a decision comes in, or indeed, as um, we heard earlier about, you know, once you're vaccinated, does that change how you might behave? Well, that's important to take, take into account. And that's sort of linked to unintended policy consequences. So it's fine to have a policy, yet we want to save lives, so get everyone vaccinated. What else might be going on? What are the unintended things you hadn't perhaps thought of that you might want to tease through when you weigh up your, um, your decision? But I think there's something that's you know, even more important that we've heard much less of, and that is ethical literacy, 
um, which hopefully some, some of you are much more experts on than myself. I, I usually say this as an economist, we have no ethics. We just believe in, uh, in money and costs and benefits and so on. So we, you know, love means nothing to us as, a, as economists. But, um, I, you know, of course, ultimately, some of these things may be more important than the scientific issues. And they may override the science and the social science and the statistics. And I think it's important to bear that in mind because, as we've heard, these things are really complicated. They're not just complicated, they're really uncertain. And I think the evidence even now on many of these things is still uncertain. Um, so I'll, I'll touch on one or two of the things that we've heard before in terms of vaccine efficacy, but just emphasize a couple of additional points. So th this is, you know, we had the, the vaccine trials. We're now in a situation where we can look back at data and the UK published these, these vaccine surveillance reports and they, they publicize what they call the consensus estimates of efficacy, looking at various different outcomes. So these are some um, effectiveness effort, eff uh, estimates for the Pfizer booster. So they break it down by Pfizer two dose, um, AstraZeneca, Moderna. I picked fi Pfizer booster because you know AstraZeneca has sort of been withdrawn, not used anymore. So Pfizer is perhaps more common in the UK, but they're not that dissimilar. So we got against infection, hospitalisation, mortality, and transmission. So you could be infected, but does a vaccine make you less likely to transmit? Uh, you can straight away see there, the consensus is we don't have data on that. We don't really know about that, even now. Um, infection, so we haven't got, they, they do distinguish with symptomatic infection, which I just haven't included here. We just got infection here. You can see um, not to three months, about 40% is a consensus for the Pfizer booster. It's a little bit lower for some of the other vaccines for, for AstraZeneca on the two dose, for example, but it rains, wanes quite rapidly. So after four to six months, it's down to 20%. These are the confidence intervals in brackets. So that sort of relates to Gavin's idea. You know, are we 90, 95% confidence interval? In other words, about a 5% chance of making a type one error. So that's the sort of reasonable range we might expect. So once we get to six to eight months, the, the estimate is probably zero um, effectiveness against infection, but much higher effectiveness against hospitalization or mortality. So we're thinking about the effectiveness of vaccines for us being infected. Okay, it's not non-existent, but fairly low. But it's a different matter in terms of hospitalisation and mortality. Now that's relevant when we think of um, you know, policy, where policy is based on do we make people vaccinated who aren't at high risk, but also in terms of personal decisions. So I thought it might be helpful just to do a quick sort of back of the envelope calculations. As all, you can pick a number if you like, but I picked the sort of middle four to six months um, rates when you're about 20% less likely to be infected, if we believe the consensus. Um, mortality though, quite a big chunk. You're, if you get COVID, you're 70% less likely to die overall than if you weren't unvaccinated. Okay, and that's a, the comparison uh, group with these studies. Um, it's quite a high number, but it's worth putting that into, into the framework of what does that mean for your actual risk reduction? And that's going to depend on all sorts of things. It's going to depend on your age, as we've already seen. There's drastically different risk profiles for the very young and the very old. Also on whether you're previously infected. We know that previous infection gives a very high level of, um, of immunity, particularly against um, you know, hospitalisation and mortality, but also other characteristics. So we know that the vast majority of people who are younger, who died, had some underlying condition. So your, your health, maybe Down syndrome, um, diabetes and so on, really matters in these things. So it really um, affects the absolute risk reduction. So just as, a, as an example, and by the way, I put quite a few points in, note uncertainty. So lots of these things, we're, we're still really uncertain. But these are, these are some estimates, probably the reasonably up-to-date estimates of pre-vaccine fatality rates, which are similar to what we saw earlier. So if you're 60 plus, we're talking about 1%, and it goes up rapidly after, you know, if you're 80 plus, it's much higher than that. In other words, if you get COVID before the vaccine, okay, no vac vaccine, you might expect on average a 1% chance of mortality. Whereas if you're under 20, we're talking 0.0003%. So a really drastic difference. What does that mean in terms of absolute risk reduction? In other words, your, your practical, when you're taking this personal decision, when you're vaccinated, how much does your risk go down? So if we think about 
somebody 60 plus, again, covering a you know, big range of uh, groups there, with and without vaccination. Um, so we're saying, well, your infection fertility, fertility rate, roughly 1%. In other words, if you get infected, you've got a 1% chance of dying. Over a period of time, this period of time when you get some you know, protection, so perhaps over, say, six months, whatever period you want to think about, maybe you've got a 50% chance of being infected. So a high, you know, high level of, trans of prevalence, because as we heard earlier, that matters a lot in terms of your risk reduction. So we just assume there's a relatively high re prevalence. And then your, um, that means your actual risk of dying over this period is halved, because you've got a 50% chance of being infected over that time. If you're vaccinated, what happens? Well, you get a lower fatality rate. It goes down 70%, 75%. You get a slightly lower, not much re reduction, in the chance of being infected. So I use that midpoint, 20%. So your overall risk goes from 0.5% to 0.1%. So a sort of plausible uh, absolute risk reduction is 0.4%, so that's 4 per 1,000 which sounds much less, it's not as impressive as 75%, a reduction of 0.4 percentage points, if you like, but actually it's quite significant when we're talking about the risk of death. So if you think if you vaccinated a million people, well, you know, you've got four per thousand, so that's 4,000 people who might not die if they were vaccinated relative to whether they were, were unvaccinated. Okay, so potentially quite significant. On the other hand, for under 18s, if we do the same thing, you can guess it's tiny. So the absolute risk reduction, if we use the same sort of numbers, um, around about 1.2 per million is your reduction in risk. Okay? So not nothing, but, but very, 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 very small. Impact on hospitalisation, well, the, we, we've got some UK HSA estimates on how many hospitalisations will be prevented for vaccination. They, they estimate that um, if you vaccinate a million people, over a year, then, you know, relative to being unvaccinated, and of course that means different things, two courses, booster and so on, so it's a very sort of generic um, figure. If you're 70 plus, you would, you would uh, eliminate over 3,000 hospitalizations. But if you did a million um, 12 to 15 year olds, you'd eliminate about 30 hospitalizations. So again, a massive, massive difference. There's other things to take into account though. Previous infection, and health. So previous infection, there or thereabouts, we expect about a 90% reduction in mortality risk. So if you've been infected and you've survived, maybe a big if in some cases, you then get infected again, you're, uh, you're much, much less likely to die. You are much less likely to be infected as well. So it goes across infection, hospitalisation and mortality, and it's, it, la it la seems to last a lot longer than um, from vaccina vaccination in terms of the protection against infection along with the uh, caveat of uncertainty. Um, but then we have the pre-existing health conditions as well. So if you're, if you're sort of, you know, 40 years old, haven't got pre-existing conditions, you're in a very different situation, so you know, a, a much lower chance of um, having a serious uh, in, impact from COVID. So both of these would drastically affect your absolute risk reduction. So when you're thinking about the personal vaccination decision, then all these things really matter. And when we go back to what we, we had at the start, the approach in the UK eventually was to say, well, we think pretty much everyone should be vaccinated over the age of about 11. And that was a sort of line. You know, it took a while for, for 11 plus year olds to come into the equation. But certainly from, from July 2021, um, the, the expectation was that everyone over 18 should get vaccinated. Certainly in my university, all the messages were, you're 18, you know, if you come to university, we expect you to be vaccinated. It wasn't compulsory, like in many universities. US colleges, but there was a strong expectation and sort of signage everywhere. Um, but if we think about uh, the, the decision, it's not just your benefits, and it's not just mortality, of course. There could be benefits from you know, not having serious illness from COVID, so that's just an, an example. We've also got the, uh, the risks, and we've heard a bit, a bit about that al already. Short-term side effects, a sort of fever, you know, you know, kids who perhaps aren't affected by COVID, it's relevant. Are they going to be off school for, for days? Are they going to miss, miss school, even if it's not that serious? But there are the more significant issues. So we've heard about blood clots with AstraZeneca, myocarditis, and so on. The other thing people don't talk about, though, I think, is uncertainty. So the, the vaccines were produced in a quick period of time, covering all the relevant stages. 
But inevitably, there's uncertainty over longer-term issues. We saw that with AstraZeneca. You know, early on, we didn't really know about the, uh, the blood clots. That came to light um, you know, in various countries, and they gradually, one by one, withdrew the, withdrew the vaccine for, or withdrew it for under 40-year-old women, was a particular group there. So inevitably, there's some uncertainty. We don't know what will happen over the next few years, maybe, maybe nothing. There's been concerns about you know, menstrual issues and so on. Um, people make allegations about impacts on cancer. Well, who, who knows? You know, as we, we've heard, it's perhaps hard to unpick uh, you know, conspiracy theories and, what, and what's reliable and unreliable information. But one of the points about uncertainty is that it has a different effect for different people. So my mum, who was 87, when she was thinking about getting the vaccine you know, early on, it was a no-brainer for her. She said, well, if, you know, if something happens to me long term, I'm 87. She was very tolerant. She knew there was uncertainty, but she was quite tolerant of that. Whereas when I was talking to my um, you know, 18-year-old daughter, or my two, two boys, it's a different matter. Because, of course, you know, if there's something that does come up that we don't know about, um, it's a much higher risk for somebody who's young um, because the consequences may be there for, for longer. Uh, I, I won't say too much because of the time. So th th there's some interesting data on short-term vaccine side effects from the, the American V-Safe project, which is sort of related to their VAERS uh, collection data. So not formally, um, you know, the, the sort of randomised controlled trial on side effects, but gives you a sort of an idea. So these systemic reactions, most of which will be fairly minor and, you know, passing fever, um, tiredness and so on. Uh, th this, this is particularly for, um, in the first seven days for children, um, for adolescents, uh, for the second dose, for the second dose of, I think this, they didn't split this down by the, um, you know, by the vaccine type. They did, sorry, these are the overall figures, but for any vaccine. Um, unable to attend school, around about 4%. So um, you may remember when they rolled out the vaccine to UK school children, the big argument was this will stop people missing school because of COVID, which of course is true because you, you know, you had seven, if you had less chance of getting COVID, you were off school for five to seven days if you got COVID because that's part of the requirement. But about 4% of children would miss school from the vaccine. Medical treatment, 0.8%. Hospitalisation, relatively low, 0.04%. So about 400 um, in a million. Uh, on the other hand, when we, if we remember the UK estimates of how many hospitalisations vaccines avert in uh, children, it's around about 30. So, you know, to the extent we believe the, v, the V-safe data, about 10 times as many children would end up in hospital from the vaccine as would from um, uh, being averted from COVID. Um, mortality risk, you, you've probably seen, there's some really controversial stuff out there about uh, you know, anecdotal evidence, oh, I, my friend had the vaccine and died the next day, and there's all these debates about it. Um, so I'll just say a quick bit about that. We, we've got two broad sources for mortality because it's such a rare event, you know, it tend, would tend not to get picked up in the randomized controlled trials. We have some data from the yellow card report. In the US, that's the, the VAERS. Some data from ONS cause of death, so where it's been mentioned on the death certificate as the underlying cause of the death. Both of them have some flaws. So the yellow card data, it's not exhaustive, so you don't have to um, report if there's, a, if there's a side effect. But really importantly, reported does not necessarily, at least, mean caused by. So, you know, it may be reported somebody died from a vaccine after, you know, a week or what have you. Would they have died anyway? Well, of course, in a general population, some people would. There's no controls for, for that. So some people say, well, the VAERS data is really selective. You know, the, I think um, the MHRA say about, only about 10% of side effects are reported. So some people have said, well, actually, whatever deaths we see there, there's 10 times as many in the real world. On the other hand, with COVID, I think the MHRA would argue there's a much higher rate of reporting of side effects because they've made much more of an effort there. So it's, you've got to be really careful with that. Cause of death reports published by the ONS month by month usually depends on an inquest, so there can be a big delay. Again, not exhaustive because it's where a doctor has put down or an inquest has determined that the COVID vaccine, for example, was um, you know, the cause or the underlying cause of death. Um, just to give you where we are with that, so, you know, Lots of caveats, take it as you will. On the yellow card uh, reports, we're around about 2,500 deaths have been reported, um, potentially linked to the COVID vaccine. When you look at the cause of death, it's, only, it's about 60. Okay? It's a really big, big difference. Possibly the truth is somewhere in between, although, you know, as I said, some people would argue that even the, 
The yellow card is vastly underreported. So really, who knows? Just one point of comparison. The cause of death reports, we do have some comparisons with deaths from all other vaccines. So influenza. And again, there's caveats because they're given to different groups of people. They're not necessarily whole population rollouts. But over the past, um, from 2013 to 2021, from all of the vaccines, there's only one death been reported in those times. So, you know, I think what, what we can say is, yeah, there probably is an issue from um, deaths from COVID vaccines that looks a little bit different to other vaccines, even with all those other caveats in there. But we've also got to be careful when people talk about, you know, tens of thousands of people dying from vaccination and, and so on. Okay. Um, so where are we with these personal decisions? The net benefit of vaccination depends hugely on you as a person. So you can think of an elderly person like my mum, not previously infected. You know, they're likely going to get a very significant benefit from vaccination. The known risks, there are some, are relatively small. Uncertain longer-term risks, they're probably quite tolerant to. That was certainly my mum's attitude. It seems a fairly easy decision. On the other hand, you take a, a young, healthy male, for example, where we know there's some myocarditis risk in, you know, of, of vaccination. Um, essentially, if they're previously infected, statistically, there's probably zero benefit to them. Okay. I mean, you know, you, you, you've got to go a lot of decimal places before you get some, some benefit because of that previous infection and their age. There are some known risks, they're small, but they're not zero. They're, signif you know, they're significant. And then there's this uncertainty you're probably a, a little less tolerant over. So it's a drastically different decision there. And probably when we get to a, ch to a child, you know, an 11 or 12-year-old for a parent, it's probably, a no, you know, it should be a no-brainer. Okay? Of course, there's other things going on, two in particular. One is the, the, the Pope's idea that, you know, it's an act of love for other people. And, the, you know, earlier on you talked about this potential ethics of do you um, vaccinate people who, on the grounds they may infect other people. Okay? And then there's also the ethical issue. So if perhaps you're concerned about the provenance of some of the vaccines in relation to abortion, that might trump everything. You might say, well, actually, you know, for me, I think it's my conscience, I can't have the vaccine. And of course, that changes your, your decision. But if we sort of put that ethical thing out of the way, from a public health point of view, it seems slightly odd what we, what we had in this country as a policy and the assumption that everyone should be benefited. And we still see this sometimes, you know, um, you, see in, in, you see it in medical papers, it's almost a sort of mantra that has to come at the end, even if they found side effects or whatever. But of course, we still know that vaccination is uh, the right decision for the vast majority of people. I don't know if editors insist that goes in there. I think that's, a, that's hard to sustain. Okay? It's very, very, very different. Um, but this is crucial. Does vaccination re reduce risks to others? Because when we come to policies, vaccine passports, shaming the unvaccinated, um, you know, sacking Swiss guards who don't get vaccinated, whatever it might be, um, you know, saying you can't come to mass, it really depends on this. Does it reduce risk to others? And we've already seen we don't really know about transmission, so we can sort of really only go on infection. And we, we've seen there's probably a small temporary reduction in personal infection risk. You know, we said about 20% after, after three months. So not especially high, but it probably is there. But when we look at the impact on population infection spread, that's where the evidence is much weaker. Because the population may be very different to, um, you know, to what happens on an individual basis. So, for example, you get behavioural, you get cohort effects. Behavioural effects, you may get risk compensation by the vaccinated. So one of the, one of the things that was a bit of a puzzle is that COVID infection rates seem to be higher in the first week or two after vaccination. Now, it may take some time for the protective effect to come in, but why do we observe that increase in, in COVID? And there's lots of debate. Was it because people were injected and then they changed their behaviour? They started to go out, you know, you know, um, you know didn't take so much care about testing. And there is some evidence um, also that people, you know, that if the vaccines don't make you less likely to be infected, but less likely to have a symptomatic infection, then you may be less aware of your symptoms. Okay, you may be less likely to get, to get tested, perhaps, or you don't realise you have COVID. Um, but the other one is a cohort effect. And this is an important one, because if it's the case, as there's some evidence to say, uh, that people with previous infection were more reluctant to get vaccinated, and certainly more reluctant to get the booster and, and, and so on, then what you might observe in a population, 
the population of the unvaccinated, if they've got a bigger proportion of previously infected, they've got a lower risk of passing it on. So there's actually no guarantee when you look at populations, so you're your parish priest and we're saying we've got a group of um, vaccinated people, group of unvaccinated people, who has higher risk of being infected? Well, actually, you're not quite so sure. But we do have some data on, on this. Um, the, the point being real world population risks may be very different to sort of formal efficacy estimates. There is some data which isn't published anymore, but the UK HSA used to publish data by posit of positive tests by vaccinated or unvaccinated. And there was a big, you may remember, there's a big controversy about th this, because one of the issues is we don't know how many people are unvaccinated. So th this is back in the, the, when they stopped publishing it back in March 2022. So this is two estimates of the percentage of 18 plus who were fully vaccinated. And, and the, the reason we don't know is because we still don't know how many people are in the population. So we know we've got records of how many are vaccinated. And UK HSA published data on the, the NIMS population database, which is linked to, to vaccinations. And they, they estimated, um, which way around is it, was 79% uh, were vaccinated. On the other hand, if you use the ONS population estimates, it's much higher. It was about 89%. Um, okay. So, um, how, you know, how can we compare? Well, they also looked, uh, they published the data of what percentage of people uh, were testing positive were fully vaccinated. Well, by March 2022, it's about 91%. So in fact, with either population, it was slightly higher. So in other words, people were testing positive, and there's a big story as well, because there may be different ways that, you know, people may have different chances of testing positive, were testing positive at higher rates, slightly, um, than uh, the vaccinated, irrespective of the population denominator you used. So this is important, because if you've got a, a policy that says, well, the vaccinated are potentially at higher, uh, un a lower risk than the unvaccinated, and we're going to make life different for them in society. Actually, the data, at best, we can say, well, there's no evidence that the transmission risk is greater for unvaccinated groups. We can't say it absolutely isn't different because the transmission data is so uncertain. And there's still you know, questions about all these ways of reporting. But if anything, probably the evidence was that the vaccinated were perhaps slightly more likely as a group to um, be infected than the unvaccinated, if anything. Okay? So almost the opposite of what the policy was, uh, was based on. That doesn't mean that personally, by vaccinating, you may still marginally reduce your risk of being infected. We're talking at the population level. So if you think about policy consequences of, of this, well, we haven't talked much about freedom, but that's an important issue. You know, when you have policies that sort of restrict people from doing things, that's not zero cost to people. It's important, but hard to quantify, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, one of the big issues is uh, care homes. So we talked about the vaccine mandate for care home staffing. The reason I mention that is because uh, I've just had a paper accepted, which will be published in a couple of weeks, but I can give you a sneak preview. The results looking at the, the care home vaccine mandate because we haven't up to now had any evidence on what happened. You know, people were saying, well, we're going to lose staff because it's a you know, staffing crisis in care homes. Staff will leave the care homes because they can't be vaccinated and so on. Um, but on the other hand, perhaps we'll save lives from forcing staff to be vaccinated. Okay? So, so I'll say a little bit about that. So this is the, the, the peak preview uh, in management science. Um, headline results. I'd love to talk about the methodology in great detail, but I suspect you, you might not want to. Um, the, it really worked. It really worked in, in reducing the percentage of, uh, of care home workers who were unvaccinated. It was a really big hit, and you can look at the point when the policy was announced, when it was, um, it, the law was passed, when you had the first deadline in September. At each of those points, you have this reduction in, in the percentage unvaccinated. We can compare the data in England to Wales, where it wasn't implemented, and to other care settings where it wasn't implemented. It really did have a big impact. As a but, though, this was at the expense of lots of care workers going. So one of the reasons a percentage unvaccinated went down, there was a net reduction in care home staff. Some staff would be replaced. There's a big increase in um, agency staff, which is another, another issue. But obviously, the staff were sacked or decided to leave the profession because they were unvaccinated. Some of them will be replaced by people who were vaccinated. But there was a, probably a net reduction of between 14 and 18,000 carers in the, um, in the elderly care home sector, okay, which is 
you know, we're talking two to three percent, uh, or I think it's two, yeah, yeah, around about two, three, four percent. So a small percentage, but obviously in a crisis sector where staffing is already under crisis, not insignificant. Um, however, when you look at mortality for care home residents, there's no effect. Or at least let's be careful, otherwise Gavin will tell me off, there's no observable impact. So there's no significant impact. And it's a little bit more uncertain, so the, the confidence intervals for mortality are a bit wider, um, you've got smaller sample sizes and, and so on. But whichever way you torture the data, there's no significant impact that you can observe. And it's, it's actually probably not a surprise, because you know, these were a very highly vaccinated population. Care home workers who were unvaccinated, we know they probably took you know, different measures. They, they had to be tested, they may have been more aware of symptoms and so on. But the data is you know, probably there, this really drastic, radical policy came in to sack workers who, for example, they were Catholics and decided they want, didn't want to be vaccinated because of the abortion link, or they just thought it wasn't right for them. They're a you know, 20-year-old woman or man and thought it, the, the, the risk-benefit wasn't right. They were sacked. It's hard to observe um, a benefit from that. Um, so we think of policy consequences. That's one of them, care home staffing. You've got direct costs of vaccination. They're not irrelevant. If you're deciding, do we have a whole population rollout or do we target it to you know, the over 70s or what it might be? There's economic consequences in terms of the resources you have for other health issues. Um, there's broader economic effects. So there's some, some quite nice data looking at the impacts of um, the vaccine passports on the nightlife industry, particularly in Scotland. And you know, there were different views, actually. Some economists said, well, this will give people confidence, so actually more people will go out. But the, there does seem to have been a hit when these were introduced, certainly in Scotland and England. Probably not a, you know, not a surprise, although both effects may have been going on. Impact on vaccine hesitancy. Well, I think this is a, an, an interesting point because this is you know, one of the big issues we're, uh, we're, we're talking about, isn't it? You know, what do we do about these online... Um, messages about the different the low quality information people get. I think this goes two ways. When we think of vaccine hesitancy, one of the problems is people's perceptions of public health messages. And if you go back to when the vaccines were introduced, people were saying, all the conspiracy theorists were saying, well, okay, they're introducing it, you know, great, but you know what will happen. Um, they'll roll it out for your children, children will be, will be vaccinated, um, they'll make you have it. You know, you won't be allowed to go out without vaccination. And everyone said, oh, what a load of nonsense. And then, of course, all those things happened. So not so much in the UK. Some of them did here, but in Italy and Austria, they brought in law saying everyone had to be vaccinated by law. So what happens? So you're thinking about this. You've observed this debate. And you've, said, you've seen government ministers say, oh, this is never going to happen. And the conspiracy theorists you see online saying, you watch my words. It's, a, it's a, you know, the big pharma are driving this and they will make sure it's rolled out to everyone and then you'll be, you'll be pushed to get it. And then you see that happens. What does that do to your trust in public health? Well, there's a, there's a really nice paper, um, you know, this is some, some data, that all childhood vaccinations have been hit. Lots of reasons for that, by the way. It's not just about vaccine hesitancy, it's about access to healthcare during lockdowns and so on. But there's quite a few studies suggesting there has been a reduction in trust in vaccinations per se. Um, and there's, there's actually some, some nice data by, the, these are um, people from the, uh, linked to the vaccine rollout, looking at some uh, conjectural data on how people will, uh, will you know, de make decisions. And their conclusion was that mandatory vaccination policies lead to detrimental long-term impacts on trust. Okay? If people say, well, I'm being forced to do this, I think, well, hang on, does that mean it's not in my best interest? Shouldn't be a surprise. It reduces uptake of COVID vaccines as well as routine immunizations. And actually, actually, I think in some ways, these sort of um, you know, mandatory coercive type policies can, can have two effects because what they can do, they can encourage uptake amongst people for whom it may not be there in their best interest. They may actually have more adverse effects. They're very young. And you think all those policies, vaccine passports for nightlife, care homes, you know, they're focused on the young, general, by and large, on younger people, the ones who don't benefit from the vaccination. So more of them are likely to get vaccinated because some do succumb. Vaccine hesitancy, they think, oh, the, the conspiracy theorists were right, you know, there's something dodgy going on here, I'm going to hold back. Actually, there will be people who, it really would be beneficial to be vaccinated, who will not get vaccinated as a result. Um, so who do we trust? Politicians, public health officials, keyboard warriors, academics, 
should, I should say trust academics. Actually, I, I wouldn't, I'm afraid, because I've seen some really, really bad practice in, in my field, in the, the economics field, in, in the COVID era. Public health officials, I'm afraid they've had not, not a good track record in terms of the messages that have been given. Internet keyboard warriors, well, there's, been, there's some disastrous stuff out there. There have been some really effective stuff out there. I haven't really got time, but there's a, you may have seen Kelly Cronart in America, who's just a mum who knows about data, started publishing daily data um, in, in Georgia, and she tackled the, the Center for Disease Control, the main US um, body putting out COVID information, for um, a series of huge errors in how they were assessing childhood risk from COVID which they then had to back down, and she ended up publishing a paper with academics at universities. She, she was literally just a, a keyboard warrior, a, a, a mom, who um, you know, changed, if you like, the, the perception of the, of the official public health uh, people in, in the States. There's lots of counterexamples on the other side of not so good um, you know, keyboard warriors, if you like. Um, Here's an example, though. So Matt Hancock saying, this vaccine will not be used for children. It's not, it hasn't been tested on children. It's an adult vaccine for adult population. And of course, a few months later, the vaccine was rolled out to, to children. And we've seen, you know, was that really warranted in terms of the cost and benefits? Minister insists no plans to introduce vaccine passports following reports of UK trials. No one has been given or will be required to have a vaccine passport. And then a few months later, what do we get? So, if we're thinking about some of the messages that come out from, from public health, we have to be, we, we can't say we can just trust them. We think of some of the mistakes, so this downplaying of natural immunity. This is actually a policy on YouTube. If you published uh, you know, something which said, well, natural immunity can give you a lot of protection, then it wouldn't, your, your video wouldn't go on YouTube. But it came out time and again, more so in the States than the UK, this message that we don't know about natural immunity, but we do know about vaccine immunity. Overplaying infection protection. So this idea that early on, you know, you may have seen statements by Joe Biden, if you get vaccinated, you will not get infected. Well, we know now that there may be some reduction, but fairly, fairly minor and fairly, fairly short lasting. Whole population rollout. You know, what was the justification for, for that? Very, very hard to see. Suppression discussion of vaccine harms. I, my view is, perhaps people have a different view, people are quite willing to understand this is a new vaccine. We understand there may be risks, there may be side effects. Um, and some of them will be unknown. And if public health had been very frank about that from the start, um, I think we'd probably be in a better position. But unfortunately, what we had was, well, you know, Ofcom saying, well, we, we've got to be so careful before we have you invite onto the telly people who have um, died. So Lisa Shaw is an obvious one. Her husband, you know, has been on telly. So she, her story has got told. She used to work for the BBC. She died, died after Ast AstraZeneca. But time and again, there's been suppression of discussion of vaccine harms in all sorts of um, forums. Downplaying costs of mandates and, and passports. Well, we've talked a bit about that already. But I think more importantly, abandoning basic public health ethical principles. And I think that's, um, you know, well, I'll come back to that. Takeaways from the evidence, there's loads of uncertainty over effectiveness, eff efficacy and so on. But much of vaccine policy, when it was rolled out, was not evidence-based. And politicians, as politicians do, gave an impression, yes, this is going to save lives, it's based on the evidence, follow the science, we're only doing what the scientists are telling us. It's a much more complicated story than that. Public health messaging about vaccination often has been misleading, sometimes downright false. Okay? Not always, of course. So what, what do you do? As, uh, you know, what does the Pope do? The Pope's not an expert on, you know, on the st statistical methodology, on the... Uh, social science or on the science, you know, m most people aren't. So how do people respond? This is where I think the, the missing gap, particularly in the, in the church, but I think in society more generally, in politicians, um, is that is this ethical literacy. It's really hard to get to the bottom of what's going on, what will be the benefit. But actually what we did, I think, was abandon general principles which would have been much more helpful. So there was this focus on, well, we think this policy might reduce some COVID deaths. And that was a focus entirely, as opposed to taking a whole picture about the harms to children, but more generally, if we could talk about lockdowns and so on, um, but in terms of vaccines, the harms in terms of freedom. Um, and some of the sort of, it's not, you know, as I said, I'm an economist without ethics, but you know, the idea that you, you generally have free and informed consent is an essential requirement for treatment. So free and informed. 
So if you think of some of those quotes, you know, you're, you're a young Catholic, for example, and you see the Pope saying, you know, it's suicidal or everyone should, should be, and then you have pressure from Piers Morgan saying, well, you know, how, how shameful to be unvaccinated, and you need the vaccine passport. Is that really free and informed consent when you're, you know, you're making that decision? I, th I would argue it's, it's probably not. Um, normally, I think there's a normal right to refuse treatment, including on grounds of conscience. And I think if you deviate from that, maybe there's cases where you can, you can force somebody to have treatment, perhaps depending on their mental capacity, but that's a really serious issue. So the idea that you can sack vaccinated care workers unless they get vaccinated, I think that's probably a breach of this principle, certainly when you have a law saying you have to be vaccinated um, for, for school, so, or for you know, the general population. If, you're gonna, if you think you can make a case for that in some circumstances, I think the evidence bar at a minimum needs to be really high. You need to be sure there's really strong benefits and you're certain of those benefits. If you like, sort of the first no harm principle should, should be there. Unless you're sure, you don't breach that principle. Maybe you shouldn't breach it at all. Maybe we have an absolute right to refuse treatment. At a, so at a minimum, you need a really high bar of evidence and uncertainty. And crucially, public health messages. This is a long-standing principle of public health. You don't do public health by shame and by pressure or by guilt. And yet, that's exactly what happened with the vaccine rollout. It was shame, guilt and pressure, and in some cases more than that, it was coercion. But all these things, all these messages that, that came out, and you know, a public health scientist might say, well, it wasn't us sort of putting out these messages from Piers Morgan and so on. I'm afraid there was a culture in the whole of society which came from leaders at all levels, including within the church. So, for example, the parish in Nottingham that said, you know, we are shaming you. You are not allowed to come to mass unless you are, unless you are vaccinated. So I think my message would be, actually, we need to take a step back and learn lessons from this. And the lesson isn't just scientific literacy. It's great if we can be more informed about all these things. We need to think about rights and wrongs and about our areas of limitation. So the Pope, in my view, I think, was, you know, became part of a project to encourage vaccination, you know, with the best of intentions and the best of motives. But actually, there's no reason to think what, that he had that expertise in this whole um, you know, level decision-making about your, your personal decisions, but also about policies. And the same with you know, parish priests and, and bishops. And it, probably the lesson should be, well, we need to take a step back. We're not those experts. We will try to understand the science. We'll try to understand the uncertainties and so on, but we'll also stick to our you know, ethical principles the idea of, of inclusion, the, the free and informed consent and so on, and the right of conscience, which is you know, particularly relevant for, for, for the church. And so, it, so I think the lesson for us is not so much scientific literacy, but ethical literacy. Thank you.